I swear just now. I don't want to disturb my dear. You typed it during the class. Yeah. I think it's all getting recorded. You didn't stop the recording. I don't know. I started it. All right, welcome back. Uh, we'll um, yeah, continue the class. Um, yeah, Jeffina has posted a question here, which I have not to see before the break. Uh, so yeah, why were palm branches used uh, to greet Jesus when he was coming in? Uh, this was palm branches symbolized victory uh, in the ancient world. Uh, when a victorious king would come back from battle, in fact, you know, they would meet him uh, even as he's entering the gates of the city. They would meet him uh, with palm branches uh, to signify that uh, he has won a great victory and now he's walking back, you know, bringing uh, a lot of wealth from the enemy, bringing a lot of slaves from the enemy. Uh, so it is a time of celebration. And the palm branches were supposed to represent that. So when Jesus is making his entry here into Jerusalem, they are, uh, you know, anticipating a great victory over the Romans. So when they are waving those palm branches, they are declaring, you know, basically and saying, "Oh, this Roman rule is now going to be over very soon. Our king is going to liberate us." And so they are so disappointed when Jesus does not turn out to be the savior that they wanted him to be. Uh, and, you know, so, uh, which is why they turn against him so easily. Uh, their political ambitions were shattered. Uh, so, palm branches mainly symbolized victory in battle. Uh, and so they're uh, associated with royalty, with uh, warfare, uh, with victory and all of that. Yeah. Um, um, any other questions? If anyone has, you can post it or you can just, you know, unmute and also ask. All right. So, um, yeah, uh, before the break, uh, we were looking at a couple of references from Isaiah, which talk about how certain people will not be receptive to uh, what the Messiah, um, you know, wishes to bring to them. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, so we, we we looked at one verse which was mentioned in John twelve thirty eight. There's another verse also mentioned, uh, which is in verse forty and forty one. If someone could please read out that, uh, just verses forty and forty one. It is significant what is being mentioned over there. 40 and 41, please. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Yeah. Now look at the context of this. Jesus says, the light is still there. I am still here believe in me and uh, some people who have seen the signs he has performed they choose not to believe and he goes away he hides himself from them and why does he hide uh, from them and no longer pursue them because the words of the prophet isaiah are being fulfilled um, so the lord has revealed his arm to these people uh, and they refuse to believe it now that is a reference to Isaiah 52.10. In Isaiah 52.10, uh, this is what it says. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Um, in the Old Testament, wherever you have the term arm, the arm of the Lord, the right hand of God, uh, these are basically uh, metaphors symbolizing the strength of God. You know, so uh, if I were to say, uh, you know, the arm of that king is strong, 
it's basically uh, me declaring and saying oh that he is very victorious in battle so the arm basically the, the arm the right hand these are terms which symbolize power uh, victory so the lord he lays bare his holy arm he reveals how powerful he is how victorious and triumphant he is for all the nations to see that's exactly what jesus was doing you know for the, for the, for three years uh, while he was in um, in israel he was demonstrating he was laying bare his holy arm and showing look i have come in triumph and victory i'm defeating sickness i'm defeating sin i'm you know turning people to righteousness and uh, there are greater things to come the kingdom of heaven is near all of this he is saying and the people rather than bowing down and worshiping uh, many of them are turning against him and why are they turning against him that is explained in the other prophecy in the from the book of isaiah uh, which is mentioned over here in, in our verse 40 where it says he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that so that they neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and i would heal them so if they were willing to turn then i would heal them but because they are not willing to turn god has chosen to harden them uh, because they have chosen to be hard hearted god has cooperated and made them even more hardened in their hearts okay so uh, now the interesting thing is what is mentioned in verse 41 it says isaiah said this because he saw jesus glory and spoke about him so it seems to indicate over here that isaiah saw jesus glory when these words were conveyed where exactly are these words taken from these words are actually you know he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts this is a verse which is from isaiah chapter 6 Isaiah chapter six is that very famous chapter where Isaiah sees the Lord seated on the throne, you know, in the temple, and uh, the, it says that even as the angels are crying out, "Holy!" the temple is shaking uh, because of their cries of worship. So that is the setting, and it says, Isaiah. It says over here. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus glory when he saw the uh, the Lord seated on the throne he saw the trinitarian god he not just saw the god the father he actually sees Jesus on that throne he sees the trinitarian god on that throne and the words are actually spoken by god himself over there if you go to Isaiah 6 the lord says you know that the people Uh, hearts will be hardened their eyes will not see i am going to do this to them because you know they have uh, chosen uh, to to not accept me uh, not obey me uh, not repent of their sins and uh, so he speaks words against them and then isaiah says how long should i keep proclaiming this negative message of judgment lord and then the lord says until all the cities have become empty you know because judgment is going to come upon this nation uh, because they are not uh, submitting to me and then in the last verse uh, over there in isaiah 6 in verse 13 he says you know the 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 land will be laid waste but there will be one uh, stump which is left you know like when you cut off a oak tree and only that stump of the tree is left out of that stump a new sapling sapling grows you know, a small new plant begins to grow out of that old stump and so uh, god says seated on his throne he says the land will be laid waste all these people who are now with hardened hearts they will all uh, you know come under judgment but there will be one holy seed one small remnant of people who will be willing to place their Uh, faith in me and return to me and submit to me and that remnant they will be like the holy seed that is coming out of the stump you know and uh, so 
over here um, in verse 42, you know, in John chapter 12, verse 42, it says, yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. So there is a small uh, remnant that is choosing to place its faith in Jesus, even though the rest of the nation, you know, chooses to turn against him. And uh, these are at the moment secret believers, uh, because it, it goes on to say they have not openly acknowledged their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Um, and it says in a negative way, it says in verse 43, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. You know, so uh, these are the hidden believers. And because they want to continue being praised by humans, they choose not to uh, honor God. Um, and Nicodemus, in fact, is one of them. He has not yet revealed that he is a follower of Jesus. Because in John chapter 7, we saw, right, the Pharisees, they, uh, they say, oh, have any of the rulers or any of the Pharisees believed in him? No, it's only the foolish people who are believing in him, is what they say. And Nicodemus is sitting right there. And he tries to defend Jesus and they turn on him. So at that time, they're not even aware that he has become a follower of Jesus. So Nicodemus and some others have placed their faith in Jesus, but they are not openly acknowledging it because they love human praise more than the praise of God. But later we see Nicodemus after the crucifixion of Jesus, now, when it's no more, you know, uh, it seems pointless to even be taking sides with Jesus. At that time, he comes forward. And even though he thinks that Jesus is dead, he chooses to be identified with Jesus. He brings spices to lay on his body and to honor him. So I think at that point, he reveals himself to be a true follower, where he feels that nothing more is to be gained because Jesus is dead, but he still steps forward to identify himself with uh, with his master you know who has been crucified so i think the at that time the true followers the genuine followers are shown and revealed you know at that time uh, so um, now should we say that it is wrong for uh, anyone to remain a secret believer should everyone openly acknowledge that they are followers of christ uh, what about people who are living in the Muslim countries, you know, where uh, you will be killed for your faith in Jesus? Uh, what about uh, the secret believers in China? Um, should we say that those people are hiding their faith in Jesus because they love human praise more than the praise of God? No, uh, because, um, you know, uh, for them, it's a matter of life and death. Here, these people are... Uh, hesitating to acknowledge their faith because they don't want to be put out of the synagogue. They don't want to be excommunicated. But uh, today we are living in a world where a person can just be killed uh, you know, because of their faith. And so there are people in countries who choose to keep their faith in the Lord a secret. Uh, but one thing is required. Verse 47, it says, if anyone hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. The words which I have spoken, it, he says in, uh, the Lord says in verse 48, the very words I have spoken will condemn them. So uh, it is maybe all right for a person to be a secret believer, but they must be true followers who are hearing the words of Jesus and keeping them. Then that would make them true believers. So they may not be in a position to openly acknowledge and say, I am a follower of Christ. They may need to stay hidden because otherwise they would be killed outright. Uh, but they should be people who are hearing his words and keeping them because that is the sign of a true believer. Um, yeah. So maybe we'll just move into John chapter 13, uh, where uh, we will uh, try to cover up to verse 30. Um, because verse 31 onwards is where Jesus starts his final teachings, uh, you know, uh, just before his crucifixion, he wants to prepare his disciples. So he imparts some very, very important teachings to them, verse 31 onwards. Today, we will only stop with verse 30. 
so uh, John chapter 13 begins with this uh, event where uh, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. Uh, maybe we could just read uh, verse 3 onwards. Uh, so maybe we could read out uh, verse 3 up to verse um, seven. Yeah. Three. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before we get into this passage, Jefina has raised a hand. You can go ahead with your question. So I have a question from the previous chapter from John. Uh, in verse 34, we see uh, the people answered him, We have heard from the Lord that Christ remains forever. And how can we say the Son of Man must be lifted up? So uh, they are asking, Who is this Son of Man? I have a quiet a doubt in this because I, I'm, in my personal studies, I'm reading Ezekiel. And we see Ezekiel even called as Son of Man over there. Uh, God calls him as Son of Man. So I uh, actually wanted to ask this question for a long time. When we say son of God, it makes sense. Uh, Jesus is a son of God. Uh, so what the son of man term actually uh, signifies overall in the Bible, that's one of my questions. And I also want to know the reference where it says Christ reminds for a little bit, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, yes. Mm. Okay, the, the question that Jefina has raised is um, regarding... Uh, the term son of man, uh, you know, which was used in the previous chapter. Uh, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And uh, so with regard to that, they say, uh, who is the son of man that you are talking about? Because the Messiah is supposed to live forever. All right. So, um, so Jefina's question was, even Ezekiel is also referred to as the son of man. Uh, so, uh, how should we understand this term son of man? Because obviously when Ezekiel was called son of man, uh, it was not referring to him as Messiah. On the other hand, in Daniel 7, where, it refer, where, where, where the term son of man is used, very specifically over there, it talks about a divine son of man. Because over there, God says he will uh, appoint this son of man as uh, the judge and king who will judge and rule over all the nations. Okay, so here it's talking about a divine king in Daniel 7. Uh, so the answer to that would be uh, when Ezekiel is referred to, son, uh, referred to as a son of man, it's just talking about his helplessness, his sheer humanity, um, his utter and total uh, dependence on God. It's being used as a term of weakness. But in Daniel 7, when it speaks of the Son of Man, that Son of Man is talked about as a ruler whom God himself has appointed and anointed uh, you know, to, be, uh, to be the ruler over all nations. So there is a great difference. So when Ezekiel was you know, called Son of Man, he would definitely not have uh, thought in terms of uh, any kind of divinity. All right. So the, uh, the term is used in two different ways. And these people who raise this question uh, and they ask, oh, the Messiah is supposed to live forever. And you're talking about being lifted up. You're talking about dying. Uh, so uh, what kind of a son of man are you? When they ask that question, um, yeah, they are, they have understood that Jesus is uh, uh, referring to himself as the Daniel 7 son of man, the divine king, and he's not really referring him, uh, to himself in the Ezekiel sense of the term. All right, so um, 
in Daniel 7, it does talk about a uh, divine Messiah who will be a ruler. In Ezekiel, it only talks about a helpless and weak human uh, son of man in that sense. So Jesus, whenever he uses the term, is always indicating Daniel 7. Um, so um, he wishes to indicate that he is the son of God, but he's also the one who was promised in the Old Testament. So he uses that term uh, in that sense. All right. Coming back to this um, passage, which we were kind of getting into, uh, Jesus, it says uh, in verse uh, chapter 13, verse 3, it says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. So fully knowing his power, fully knowing his authority, fully knowing who he is, that he is the Almighty One, that he is part of the Trinity, having understood these things, he gets down on his knees to start washing the feet of the disciples. He is not doing this because he is humble and downtrodden and oppressed and helpless. He is doing it as king. He is doing it as God. He is doing it having all authority and power and knowing fully who, uh, uh, what his status is. So here, it's very, very clearly being indicated to us that service uh, does not mean um, something low. It does not mean um, something that is very, uh, uh, no, uh, very base. Rather, service is something that is a characteristic of divinity. Service is something so high and valuable that the divine God, who is fully aware of his power, chooses to do it. No, which is why he says the rulers of the world, you know, they regard that uh, you know, uh, showing their authority and superiority is what makes them powerful. But he says, I have come to show you uh, something else, that actually uh, serving, serving someone, that is actually authority and power. You know, so Jesus presents a different perspective of what power is, of what authority is. And he, uh, so having understood his status, he chooses to serve. And he says, you know, you should be following this example. Uh, so rather than lording it over others, you would be people who serve others. And this is not just a, this is not a sign of humiliation. Rather, it, in fact, it shows that you do have power and authority in me. All right, so that's the that's the learning that Jesus wants to bring out to them. So having understood who he is, his status, his power, he chooses to perform this act. And uh, so for the disciples, this is something very shocking. They have only understood lordship as uh, you know, uh, bossing over people. They have not understood it as uh, service. And so here Peter objects. And he says, Lord, are you washing my feet? And uh, uh, in the Greek, uh, the way the wording is phrased, it brings out the significance of what Peter is saying. So if we were to translate the Greek wording literally into English, this is how it would sound. Lord, you of mine washing the feet. No, I mean, if we were to do the literal translation, that's basically how it comes out. Lord, you of mine washing the feet. You know, so you and me are contrasted over here. You are Lord. You are Master. You are the Messiah that we were, you know, waiting for. Me, I'm just the disciple, and my feet you are washing. You know, so this is sheer contrast. The Master is not supposed to be doing such things. It's the disciple who is supposed to be doing such things. And why is the master doing it? So the, 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 um, he very clearly brings out in his question the shock value of what is being done over here. 
is unable to understand why a master would do that. And then uh, Jesus says, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Okay. Um, then uh, this is Peter's response. He says, uh, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answers and says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Unless I wash your feet, you cannot even have any part with me. You cannot be, uh, you know, uh, even my disciple or part of my family. And then in response, Peter says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Because if that is what's going to make me a part of you, then I'd rather that, you know, that you don't just wash my feet. I wish you would just wash, you know, even my hands and my head is his response because he really wants to be uh, a part of this Jesus. He wants to uh, be a part of his life, you know. So, uh, um, so here, this is the statement that Jesus makes. He says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now, all religions basically teach that humans, they serve the gods that they have created. They go to them, they worship them, they offer things to these gods. They do all of that because they are reaching out to these gods to win their favor, uh, to somehow make those uh, gods accept them and grant them what they want. But that really doesn't work because these gods are so substandard that they need to receive something from humans, uh, you know, which will make them feel good. So these are very substandard gods that these humans have created for themselves. The living God, on the other hand, what can man ever give to him? I mean, what can humans ever offer to him that would in some way elevate him? He is already the almighty one. He is completely other. You know, that word holy literally means set apart. He's completely set apart. What can a mere human give him that would make him maybe better or feel better about himself or make him more superior or make him more, uh, or, you know, increase his status in any way? So he, the Almighty One, he chooses to reach out to humans and do something for them and they can never really do anything for him. So human religions have it all wrong. They think that they can win the favor of the gods by offering something to those gods and pleasing them in some way. But the Almighty One says, you humans have nothing to offer me. I am the one in all my superiority who can offer something to you. And then once we have received from him, you know, what he is offering, the salvation, the eternal life that he is offering, out of gratitude, we begin to serve him. So the service in no way, you know, um, which we are offering in no way is being offered to earn something. No, he could never offer him something of so much value that, you know, we earn something from him. We are nothing. So we come to him hands completely empty and we admit to him lord we are nothing we have nothing to offer you you are the almighty one you're the one who has everything and we come with empty hands acknowledging our sheer helplessness and our sinfulness and we are grateful for what you have to offer so in the religions of the world the people are going and saying you know, I'm going to be giving you this many kilograms of gold. And they think that by giving these gods that gold, they are earning his favor. You know, especially in our country, we have politicians who go to the uh, temples and with uh, great pride, they offer kilograms of gold to these uh, to these deities uh, to, to, be, to win the elections. You know, they hope that the deities will give them uh, you know, success in the elections if they give gold. So the human religions basically feel that they can offer something to these gods of value, which will somehow elevate their status. 
but the living god says there's nothing that you can uh, you can offer me so which is why um jesus was never really happy with the pharisees the pharisee the pharisaic attitude was we oh lord are keeping all these rules and regulations we have we are now worthy of being your followers so even as we come to you and offer our tithes and offer all our ceremonies to you accept us but jesus was saying acknowledge that you are nothing admit that you are sinful admit that you are totally helpless and that you have nothing to offer come to me in that state admitting that you are nothing and that i you know am everything and only i can provide something to you so come to me with empty hands and they were not willing to do that they were very proud about who they were and what they have to offer and that um cannot lead to a relationship so here jesus is saying to peter you can give me nothing i the master i need to wash you if i serve you then you can be a part of me and then out of gratitude you can choose to begin serving me and uh, peter not having fully understood what jesus is saying he says oh lord if you wash me that's the only way i can be a part of you then please lord even my head even my hands uh, you know wash even that and then jesus says he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean and you are clean but not all of you for he knew who would betray him therefore he said you are not all clean now when what is jesus indicating over here uh, what exactly is jesus talking about um john 15:3 you know explains that to us even as we you know even as we would be covering that next class um in john 15:3 uh, jesus says to them you are already clean because of the word i have spoken to you these believers these disciples they believed everything that jesus spoke to them they accepted it they submitted to it and by doing that the word cleaned them they because they accepted his word his word worked in their lives and it cleaned them um we have the same thing even in john chapter 6 uh, verses 63 and 64 where jesus says the words i have spoken to you they are full of the spirit and life and um he goes on to say yet there are some of you who do not believe so those who have believed they have received the words which are full of spirit and of life and those words have cleansed them so these peter and these other disciples who have believed in his word and they have submitted to it and they have chosen to obey it they have been made clean by the word of god and so jesus says to them because you have trusted in me you have already been made clean and so now all you need to do is continue to come to me for regular cleansing your um, so when any unconfessed sins are there we come to the lord and we confess and he forgives us of them so we are already clean it's just that we need to continue coming to him for um, you know uh, to to maintain that relationship with him uh to 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 continue enjoying the sanctification that he is granting us on a regular basis you know so that's the reason that we come to him uh so uh so uh, so so jesus uh brings out this principle and then he goes on to say um in maybe we could read out verses 12 to 17 if someone could please read out verses 12 to 17 So when he had washed their feet taken his garments and sat down again he said to them do you know what i have done to you you call me teacher and lord and you say well for for so i am if i then your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet for i have given you an example that you should do as i have done to you most assuredly i say to you a servant is not greater than his master 
nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Amen. Yes. So here the Lord says, um, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Uh, just in the earlier passage, Jesus made it very clear. It's not just talking about a physical washing. It's also talking about a spiritual washing. So what is he um, you know, indicating over here? Uh, yes, the people, uh, these disciples of his, should help each other, you know, serve each other. But there's also a spiritual meaning. Um, not only would they be physically serving each other and helping each other, in a spiritual sense, they should build each other up and help one another, you know, in 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 serving him and maintaining their spirituality. Um, the uh, we could we could say Galatians six one to two brings out this very clearly. It says over there in Galatians six one to two, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. In other words, they are washing. The, that person, you know, helping that person uh, get back on his feet and, you know, to be cleansed of that sin in which he, has, he is caught. So it says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. And then in verse 2, it says, uh, Galatians 6 verse 2, carry each other's burdens and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So here when Jesus says, you also should wash one another's feet, there are two things that he's talking about. First is physical service, where you choose to serve the other brothers and sisters. You choose to help them in their time of need. You are there for them uh, physically. But in a spiritual sense also, you carry each other's burdens. You help one another uh, stay true to the Lord, uh, to continue growing in God. So we have a spiritual responsibility towards uh, each other. We also have the physical responsibility of being there for people when they require help. Uh, so in both of these senses, uh, we are supposed to be there for one another. So if someone reduces this teaching to the you know simple act of physically washing feet in a ceremony, it kind of um, deprives this command of its true meaning. You know, because people make much about the ceremony of feet washing, um, uh, which is good because it's a very uh, you know uh, powerful symbol. But we need to go beyond just that symbol. Uh, it is easy to you know uh, uh, put on gloves, uh, you know, take some clean water. And that person who is sitting over there obviously has clean feet and you know just go through the ceremony of washing but what about when that person is in a time of need are we willing to make the sacrifices needed you know and invest our time in helping that person are we willing to you know uh, take money out of our pockets and you know uh, assist that time in their uh, assist that person in their time of need um if, if we see that person struggling in their spiritual walk are we willing to take the time to sit with them and talk to them and encourage them and build them up in the faith? Those things uh, will involve a more literal washing one another's feet than just the ceremony. The ceremony is easy, you know, uh, but what Jesus is asking for over here is actual service, the way he served his disciples. So uh, we should go beyond just the physical act of you know washing feet and we should be uh, there for people physically we should also be there for them spiritually uh, so this would actually fulfill the um, you know command which jesus is giving over here and that is why jesus says in verse 17 now that you know these things you will be blessed if you do them so we are not blessed by just knowing about these things we are blessed when we act out these things in our everyday lives so it's a question that we would need to ask ourselves am i there physically for people when they are in a time of need and they require help am i there for them spiritually to build them up uh, to support them in their christian walk 
if I am doing that, then yes, I'm actually washing their feet. I am fulfilling the command which the Lord laid down. And the Lord is, would be very pleased with us, you know, when we uh, follow this command in this manner. Um, all right. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. So maybe we could just very quickly look at this portion uh, where now Jesus starts talking about um, this person who will betray him. So Jesus says uh, to Peter, you are clean but not all of you. Okay, so he refers to Judas, uh, who is going to betray him. And um, it says in verse uh, 21, where Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Um, so in verse 22, the disciples are very surprised. You know, they do not know whom Jesus is talking about. Uh, so it says, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Um, and then in verse 26, Jesus says, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And then it says in verse 27, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So this whole thing about taking the bread, dipping it and giving it, it all sounds so um, so much like the you know celebration of the Lord's table. Um, these are all words, terminologies that we use when we are talking about the Holy Communion. Um, so if we were to, you know, just quickly turn to Matthew chapter 26, verses 21 to 28, uh, where this same, you know, event is being described there in Matthew 26, verse 22, uh, you know, it says when, when the people, when, when the disciples hear that, Jesus, you know, someone is going to betray Jesus, it says they were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, O Lord, you know. And then uh, when it comes to Judas' turn, he also says the same words. That is in Matthew 26, verse 25. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. You know, so uh, they all say this. And over there, Jesus says in verse 23, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me, will betray me. So here in the John passage, it says, the one to whom I dip the bread and give, he is the one uh, who will uh, betray. In Matthew 26, verse 26, it very specifically says, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. And in John, that is what, uh, in, the, in the book of John, that is what Jesus is doing for Judas Iscariot, is dipping the bread, giving it to him. You know, almost like, almost like as if he's saying, take and eat, this is my body. And in verse 27, it says, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Because you see, he has not taken that bread with the right attitude. What has happened for the other uh, disciples when they took the bread? You know, later Jesus breathes upon them and they receive the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, over here, when Judas takes that bread with the wrong attitude, rather than the Holy Spirit, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, the the approval of the Holy Spirit resting upon him. Rather, instead of that, you have Satan entering into him. Do you see the seriousness of this? You see, we are partakers of Jesus Christ. We are partakers of what he has done on the cross for us. So we come to him with reverence, acknowledging that he, the master, has given everything to people who come with empty hands, who can give him nothing, who have nothing to offer. We come with empty hands. And he, the one who is everything, has sacrificed all his son, he has sacrificed all that he has for us. And so he gives to us freely. 
and we are receiving that something which we could never earn we are receiving so we come to him with deep reverence with submission not having any kind of dirt in our hearts you know submitting to him and saying lord i am nothing so if i have done anything wrong please lord i confess that before you so forgive me because i wish to honor you in my life with that attitude we come to him and he freely gives his bread to us you know his body and his blood he gives it to us on the other hand is judas he is you know he he so innocently like all the other disciples says lord do you mean me you know he says you know he is he's, he's coming there with deception is coming there with such a false heart and because of that when he is even 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 in that moment if he had repented and confessed things could have changed but he continues to hold on to the deception and because he comes to the lord with that deceptive attitude satan enters into him what a serious thing so we need to be so careful in the way we approach the lord when we come to him you know for the holy communion because we we do this in remembrance of him of what he has done for us um yeah um before we um, you know uh, go further is a question here ma'am there are churches who follow this washing of feet act is it right to do it in literal action like the pastor's washing feet of the assistant pastor in the church um so yeah you know as a symbol it's a, it's a good symbol and uh, it, it is um, it is symbolizing something good so it is all right um but after the ceremony if someone could just stand up and speak for 5 minutes and bring out the meaning of what has been done and say uh, you know we have now washed the feet one another's feet and this is what it symbolizes physically we should be there for each other the way jesus physically served you know his disciples was there for them are we going to be there for one another in our time of need in this in the same way that he ministered to them spiritually and washed them when we see a believer struggling in their spiritual walk are we willing to sit with them invest time in them that would be the actual washing of feet so if someone could you know speak for 5 minutes and bring out the meaning of it then the whole thing would become uh, something that is pleasing to the lord so there's no harm in doing the physical uh, ceremony but let us back it up with the interpretation so that the congregation knows what jesus actually did because jesus tells peter very clearly what i am doing for you now is something spiritual by doing this you are going to become a part of me so there's something more involved in this uh, in this physical ceremony there's a spiritual side to it and someone needs to explain that to the congregation otherwise it just becomes a spectacle so yes so it's all right to do it physically but someone should also explain the overall significance of that uh, so then it would become more meaningful uh, yeah so um, we were able to touch upon the main aspects up to us 30 um, and so now uh, yeah next next class we will uh, begin from verse 31 all right so you know let's just close with a word of prayer if there are any other questions fine otherwise yeah we can we can close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you for the learnings that we could uh, take away today we thank you oh lord uh, that um, you uh, who have everything are everything chose to give all of that you uh, that you have your very own son for us who have nothing it is such a amazing and marvelous thing oh lord you who don't need to serve anyone you who don't need to sacrifice for anyone you chose to do that for people who can give you nothing in return it is an amazing thing oh lord so we pray that we would honor you oh lord in every way and just as you required and you said that me the master what i have enacted out you must now practice among yourselves help us oh lord to do that oh lord i really we we, we pray oh lord help us oh lord to to love one another 
and be there for one another in the way that you were there, O oh Lord, for your disciples. Help us, O oh Lord, to have hearts of love and service. Because, O oh Lord, in the next chapters, you're going to go on repeating that, that we should love one another, that we should be there for one another. Those, that was the emphasis, O oh Lord, which you laid. And that's, uh, that's, that is what is mainly on your heart. So we pray that you would help us to become people who will serve one another and that we will be there for uh, each other, even in, in our spiritual walk, oh Lord. I pray that you would um, make these things very important, oh Lord, uh, that you would emphasize these things in our hearts, imprint it on our hearts, that, Lord, we will value it the way you want it valued. Thank you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll meet again next month. Thank you, Pastor.